In the late 80s and early 90s, FM synthesis was considered the standard in music generation for PC computers, mainly because of its affordable price, but also because of its versatility. As such, most games and software from the era provided support for FM synthesis through one of the many sound cards and their clones that made use of Yamaha's well-known OPL2 and OPL3 chips. But sound cards, however, were only available for desktop computers with ISA slots inside, complicating the process of sound generations on laptops or PCs with no free ISA slots. Because of this, external solutions were introduced to the market, some using unique methods, others still relying on the old FM standard, and finally, some using the newer PCMCIA standard. One of the more recent forays in external sound devices has been Certico's replica the Kovacs speech thing, which I already reviewed and compared to the original in this video. The project was met with heavy success, and many influential YouTubers provided their positive coverage of the CVX4. Presentation The OPL2 LPT now comes into play. And while the idea of making an adlib card function over a parallel port has been explored before, the thought of optimizing the circuitry of an adlib to make it fit directly on a printer port is novel. In this video, we will look at the specifications of the OPL2 LPT, walk through the assembly process, examine different usage methods, and finally do a sound comparison with an original adlib. Unboxing. Let's see what we have in our hands in terms of components. A mainboard that connects to the parallel port via a DB25 connector. A standard headphone jack. A 2-pin jumper. A mini USB plug to provide current. A small power LED. A crystal oscillator to provide a dependable onboard clock. Reset switch. I.O. logic chips and diverse components like resistors and capacitors. A basic amplifier, a volume potentiometer, but truly the heart of the OPL2 LPT is Yamaha's own OPL2 chip, also known as the YM3812, the very same chip used in original Adlib and Sound Blaster cards. Assembly preparations. With all the components laid out and ready, comes the time to assemble and solder the OPL2 LPT. Please note that I have no previous soldering experience, so my method might seem a little ghetto to the professionals out there, and obviously this will be a learning experience for me. Here are the tools I will use for assembly, a standard soldering iron and its holder, and standard solder in a coil that I believe contains flux in the center, small pliers and cutters as well. Since I'm working on the kitchen table, I will use a thick white cardboard sheet to protect the surface and provide a lighter, non-reflective background for the camera. Finally, during the process, I will keep the instructions provided by Certico on hand at all times, to double-check my progress and catch any mistakes early. Assembly Starting with the bare PCB, my rationale is to start with the components that will be the most sturdy and will allow me to hold the OPL2 LPT firmly as I add the next ones. First is the DB25 connector that has obviously 25 solder connection pins and an additional two grips on its sides. To initially secure it in place, I solder the two grips first, then each of the 25 pins. Once all connections are made, I finish fully flowing the two grips. Second part to be soldered is the OPL2 chips socket, keeping with the sturdiness rationale. Be sure to match the notch on the PCB with the notch on the socket, as the OPL2 chip have a specific orientation. To hold it in place, I solder the two corners first, then solder the rest once it's secure. I then solder the amplifier's socket in place. Match the notch on the PCB with the notch on the socket. Both chips will be inserted at the end of the process to protect them during construction.
The USB connector is held in place with four grips that I solder first and has a total of five miniature connectors after that, which are very difficult to solder with my basic equipment. Another easy connection to make is the reset button that has four pins and no specific orientation. Simply insert, solder the four pins and move on. Next is the green power LED. Pay close attention to the diagram on the PCB since an LED will not work if installed backwards. To know which side is the negative, look for the shorter leg. Insert through the holes completely. To keep the LED in place as I solder it, I bend the two legs outwards, solder, then cut the unused portion off. Right beside the LED comes a crystal oscillator that has no specific orientation on the PCB. Push the two pins through, bend outwards and solder. I cut the excess and move on. Next part is the headphone connector. Since it doesn't stay on the PCB by itself, I temporarily add some electrical tape to hold it in place. Note that even with the PCB having 6 holes, the headphone connector only has 5 pins total, so soldering the missing pin is not necessary. Once the connector is secure, I remove the tape and move on. Coming next are the two I.O. logic chips located at the bottom of the PCB. Follow the orientation on the PCB and the indentation on the chips so they are oriented correctly. I use electrical tape again to keep them from moving as I solder their connections. Same goes for the logic chip at the top of the board. Follow the orientation printed on the PCB and align with the notch on the chip. I bend the pins slightly so it fits through the PCB, push it through, hold it in place with tape and solder a few pins. Once partly soldered, the tape can be removed to solder the rest of the chip. Next are the two resistor ladders located near the DB25 connector. I assume that the dot on the left of the text indicates pin number 1 and thus connect that pin with hole number 1 marked with a square pad. As usual, I hold everything in place with tape and solder away. Capacitors come next and these are especially sensitive to orientation. Installed backwards then powered on, they could cause serious damage to the rest of the board and any components around them. So be aware that the capacitors have a short leg indicating negative, as well as markings on the barrel itself. Insert the capacitors following polarity indicated on the PCB, bend the legs outwards to hold them in place, then solder. Note that not all the capacitors are the same in this build and be sure to follow which capacitor goes in which position according to the plan. As I progress with soldering those, I cut the excess legs as I go to give me room to reach the next capacitor. Next are more capacitors, but not in barrel form. I believe those to be ceramic capacitors. Surprisingly, those don't seem to have a specific orientation, so I just solder them as they come. Just insert, bend the legs, solder, cut the excess, and repeat. The volume potentiometer comes next. First, I bend the pins back as specified by Certico, so the volume knob goes out sideways from the OPL to LPT. Insert the pins in the PCB and solder. Ta-da! I now have control over the volume. Resistors, as small as they are, should not be forgotten even if they come last on my list. Since space is a constraint on the PCB, they have to be installed vertically, so one pin has to bend 180 degrees downwards for installation. Push the pins through the board, bend them outwards to hold in place, and solder in position. Cut the excess. Rinse and repeat for all resistors. Mm -hmm. 
Note a small mistake that I made when assembling the OPL2 LPT. I added jumpers in two places instead of one. The only required jumper is the JBB in the corner. The jumper near the FM chip is not required for functionality and it's only there to provide plus 5 volts to the OPL2 LPT in case you want to use something else than the provided mini USB port. Not taking into account the filming and preparation, I estimate the actual solder job to have taken me around one hour. Powering on. Before inserting the FM chip and amplifier, the electric circuitry needs to be tested. Simply plug a mini USB cable in any power source, mine is a laptop computer, and connect to the OPL2 LPT. If the LED power light turns on, it means that circuitry should be functional. OPL2. Once the circuitry is confirmed working, it's time to insert Yamaha's OPL2 chip along with the amplifier chip. Orient correctly with the notch, then simply push into the sockets until firmly in place. At this moment, you can relax and feel satisfied. The build is now complete. Time to admire the creation before putting it to good use. Testing. The build complete. Now is the time to test it in a computer environment. There are three utilities you need to download for your LPL2 LPT. The test program, the game patcher, and finally the TSR. They are available and updated regularly on the GitHub. I move to the basement to test everything out. Onwards! I push the LPL2 LPT into the printer port of my retro rig. I brought my laptop down as well to use as the USB power source for the OPL2 LPT. The LED comes on. So far, so good. I plug a set of small speakers into the device through the headphone jack. Even though I know the volume will be low, I'll be able to hear if anything plays. The floppy is in. Time to run the test program to see if the circuitry works along with the FM chip. Type OPL2 test to launch the program. If this goes according to plan, I am supposed to hear something from the speakers. And there it is! Lovely. This means that everything is working. Circuitry, components, soldering, FM chip. Let's move on to actually using the OPL2 LPT. There are two ways to interface games with the OPL2 LPT, each with advantages and disadvantages. The easiest one is to use a memory resident program that redirects commands sent to a hypothetical adlib card to the real OPL2 LPT actually attached to the computer. The result is seamless, but however it has the downside of taking up precious memory and since it's working continuously in the background, processing time. Minimum requirements of the TSR are a 386 processor and EMM386 to be loaded into memory beforehand. Software using protected mode, such as late DOS games, often will not work with the TSR method. The other option is to modify the games or software directly, in order for them to send ad-lib instructions directly to the OPL2 LPT. This result is more difficult to achieve since the patch program is not compatible with every game, but the advantage is that the redirection is done at the source, thus saving memory and processing time. Let's test both methods, starting with the TSR. First, we have to make sure EMM386 is loaded. Then we have to load ADL-IPT into memory when turning on the computer. The TSR can be loaded into high memory if necessary. Afterwards, just configure software to use an AdLib card as you would with a real card. Then simply run the software. There you go, the game is working with the TSR to redirect music to the OPL2 LPT.
Usage patch. Let's test the second method, patching the game directly. Note that patching is done manually for each game, and not every game is supported. The list is pretty small for the time being, but will grow as the patch program gets updated. Run the patch program to update a specific game. Once successful, configure the game to use an adlib card as you would with a real card, then run the software normally. The game has been patched successfully and now redirects music by itself to the OPL2 LPT. Let's take a few minutes to talk about features specific to the OPL2 LPT that are not available on real AdLib cards. When a game crashes, freezes, or exits as commands were being sent to the OPL2 LPT, this can leave hanging notes playing on the FM chip. The addition of a reset button mitigates this annoyance. Simply press it to reset and silence the OPL2 LPT at any time. For base aficionados like Japel, a JBB jumper was added to the OPL2 LPT, allowing the user to increase the base response of the device. In reality, this jumper doesn't increase bass response, and instead decreases mids and highs significantly to output a deeper sound. Honestly, I was initially expecting a bit more from this feature. Let's get to comparing the OPL2 LPT to an actual adlib from 1990. First, let's compare the bass noise of both devices. Then let's compare sound amplification. Is there any distortion or peaking? Let's see the fidelity of the OPL2 LPT's sound compared to the original AdLib. One of my friends owns a 3D printer and graciously offered to print a case for the OPL2 LPT project. The case design is available online on Thingiverse. Since I love time lapses, enjoy this one with me as it takes shape before our eyes.
case clips together and you need two screws to keep it shut tight. In conclusion, I'm very surprised by the OPL2LPT's reliability and how effortlessly it mimics the rich, original AdLib sound. I mean, of course, it's the same chip, but the rest of the circuitry certainly plays a part into how the sound is translated, and that aspect was recreated with respect. I was expecting more problems with the device, missing notes, noise, clicks and sounds, system slowdowns, but very little caught my attention, so that's a definite plus. Granted, my test system is a Pentium 2, downclocked to 250 MHz, so any slowdowns experienced by a 386 user will not be super tangible for me. Using the TSR was a breeze, and patching the games was equally easy. Sure, not many games are compatible for the time being, but that's on the software side, and not the OPL2LPT's fault per se. As a final decision, I highly recommend buying and using an OPL2LPT in your retro rigs. It has great availability, it's affordable, unlike AdLib cars that currently sell for a thousand bucks or more, and sound quality could be mistaken for the original. Thank you warmly for watching until the end, and see you next time.